everyone, I'm Miranda and welcome to the March Comfort Book Club discussion of The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. As always, I'm joined by my mum, Donna. Hello, everyone. And as it's Easter Sunday that yes, we're recording Easter. this, yes, we've got our uh, Simnel cake to hand, yes. <laughs> which we'll be enjoying, if not during our discussion, then right after. Yes, yes. And we've got our cup of tea. And I hope you will get cosy yes. and get your favourite hot drink for this episode as well because it'll be quite a long one, there's so much to discuss. And thank you to everyone who sent in a voice message as well to add to our discussion yes. this month. It's been lovely hearing all of it your has. thoughts. So The Secret Garden, I think we both first read as children. Yes, we? definitely, yes. And it's been a comfort read for me ever since. Yes, me too. I think it's the most marvellous story. It really is. Did, and Didn't you feel too coming to it this time? I suddenly realised, oh, it's so wonderful for every age. Yes, that's so true. Yeah. Um, it's such a powerful story about the power of love and friendship yeah. and the healing benefits of nature as well. Yeah. I really loved reading it in the springtime again. It's the perfect spring read. Do you know, I don't think it? I'd ever read it in the springtime before. Now I'm thinking, gosh, I really missed a trick there because it is fabulous to read it. It is. It really added to my anticipation and excitement yes. around the start of spring. spring burgeoning everywhere, you know, around us. That made it extra special. I yes, think. it really did. I think mm. I would always want to read it in the springtime. Yes, yes, forward. yes, I agree. And it's such a classic classic nowadays, The Secret mm -hmm. Garden, I think, is now Frances Hodgson Burnett's most famous book. But when I came to reading it again, I decided to also read a biography of her, which is very good. I recommend Beyond the Secret Garden by Anne Thwaite. It was a fascinating biography. And also Unearthing the Secret Garden by Marta McDowell gave a lot of really interesting background information too, um, specifically on the Secret Garden, which was great. And this biography doesn't have any photos, which was a shame. It was. Um, but this has lots, so they were really good to kind of read together. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that I was so interested to learn was that the Secret Garden was not one of her biggest books at all during wasn't her lifetime. That fascinating. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even mentioned in her obituary. No. No. Which I think is quite extraordinary to realise now. Um, but she wrote it quite a lot later in life. She was already a very famous author. Her most famous book was Little Lord Fauntleroy. Yes. Which is what made her a household name. Yeah. And that book just really struck a chord with the times yeah. in which she lived. Um, but she was also really well known as an adult and uh, she wrote plays. writer, yes. plays, yes. short stories. She wrote to, to live, to earn money, yeah. and she was incredibly prolific. But coming back to your point about it was lovely to read this book as an adult, I so agree, and I think, you know, in those days, there wasn't such a clear-cut distinction between adult literature and children's no, literature. Wasn't. No, we've seen that in things like The Wind and the Willows. Exactly. Yes, yeah. um, the books were marketed really to any age, and they were often reviewed in terms of people saying this is a book that any child from the age of 8 to 80 would love. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And I wish they did that more yes. still nowadays. I think yes. it's sad that some of these books aren't read by adults so much anymore because yeah. they think, well, that's just a children's book. Whereas, in fact, it isn't. It can no. really be enjoyed by adults. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think I was surprised by just how much... She'd been involved with adult books too. I, I knew her sort of children's books and had read and loved them. But I didn't realise, apart from obviously The Shuttle and um, the other the one. Making of the yes. Darkness, yeah. Yeah, um, that how much she'd written for adults as well. Yes. Which was a complete surprise to me. Yeah, but, I know. I was really interested yes. um, to learn more about that too. But, of course, these days, The Secret Garden yeah. is a book so many of us have read and loved, and many of us, too, have first come to this book as a child. Um, in fact, one of our Comfort Book Club readers, who very kindly sent in a message, Pippa, said, 
this was the first time in 30 years that she'd read the book. <laughs> so it was lovely that she came back to it as an adult. So let's listen to Pippa's message. Hi, Miranda and Donna and all of the Comfort Book Club members. I'm Pippa from the southeast of England. The Secret Garden brought such joyful memories. It is a book I haven't read in over 30 years. I found myself smiling all the way through as I felt like I was revisiting old friends. Rereading this as an adult, I loved the message of hope that permeated the book with its ultimate message of never giving up and that if you believe in yourself, you can achieve great things. Thank you for a wonderful book choice. I'm so glad that you enjoyed returning to the book, Pippa. Yes, thank you so much, Pippa. That was lovely. And I know, I think it is a book that really speaks to adults as well as children. So. It does, and the characters do have that feel of old friends when you go back to them. You know them so well. Mm -hmm. She does a wonderful job on the characterisation in this. Yes, that's so true. Yeah. Such a memorable yeah. character. Yes, very much. Um, but another of our Comfort Book Hub readers, Catherine, sent in a message saying how she has first come to the book as an adult and for the comfort book club so it was lovely to hear from people who read it for the first time as well um, so let's listen to Catherine's message hello Miranda and Donna this is Catherine from Brussels the secret garden was for me a first read and a real discovery and I must say I adored it the secret garden reminds us of the healing power of love it is when Mary starts appreciating and love the people around her that she starts to get better. It reminds us of the healing power of nature, if one can perceive and listen to what nature brings us. It is also a book about resilience. It shows how important it is to have projects in our lives. For all these reasons, it is a book that is still relevant today and will remain so, I'm sure, for many more decades ahead. For garden lovers, of course, it is also a great book. Thank you, Miranda and Donna, for this fabulous choice for the Comfort Book Club. Bye-bye. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, thank you so much, Catherine. And I'm so glad that you enjoyed the book uh, for your first read as well. That's wonderful. It is. And I loved your point as well about it being a book that shows how important it is to have projects in your life and yes. things you love, yes. people you love, but also passions and interests Yeah, too. absolutely. I mean, Dickens certainly has it as well yes, through his exactly. love of nature and the animals he rescues and everything. And yeah. Yes, that's you so see true. it again and again in yes. this book. Um, and then also Laura sent in a message about how she thought that this is a book that adults can enjoy just as much as children. That was one of the points she made and I so agree with it. So let's hear Laura's message too. Hello Miranda, hello Donna. This is Laura from Italy. The Secret Garden is one of my most cherished books and I'm so glad it is our March choice. I don't think it is a book for children only, because it deals with very important themes – loneliness, friendship, relationship with nature – in a very sensitive, delicate way. There is a moment in the story that never fails to move me. It is in Chapter 4, when Mary, after confessing to Ben that she is lonely, asks the little Robin, would you make friends with me, would you, in a soft, eager, coaxing tone. It's so touching to see Mary's little heart open up to friendship with a creature of nature after so much loneliness. All the story is a celebration of the healing power of nature at different levels, and I find it so uplifting, so comforting. Thank you so much, Laura. Oh, thank you, Laura. And I, I so agree with you about the healing power of nature in it. And in fact, I find it really interesting that it works on Colin's father when he's abroad, and he lies down and he looks at the forget-me-nots mm. by the stream. It's a lovely passage. Yes. So it, 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 nature can heal adults as well as children is a very strong message. Oh, I completely this. agree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think 
Frances Hodgson Burnett was pulling on some of her own experiences as well. We'll talk about that a bit later in this discussion as we go into the inspiration behind the actual garden. Um, but I really credit the secret garden with my own love of robins. <laughs> I think <laughs> yes, it really started you did, with I'm that sure. book. Yes, I'm sure, because um, we talked about you just fascinated by that robin. Yes, and I love yeah. that scene that Laura mentions. Yes. Um, but Frances Hodgson Burnett uh, knew a Robin herself yes. and there was a real life Robin that was the inspiration behind the one in the secret garden and I think that that is wonderful it is. Um, but we'll talk about that a bit more later I really wanted to discuss the settings in the book a bit yeah absolutely um, because I found them so interesting. Now, Frances Hodgson Burnett was herself born in Manchester. Yeah. Um, so she was originally from the north of England, yes. although um, she moved at about 15. Um, she and her family moved to Tennessee in America. Um, so she was very much um, someone who lived in both places. Yes. Um, she yes. spent a good deal of time in America as well as in the UK yeah. in her adult life as well but she visited friends in Yorkshire so she knew uh, the area. She certainly knew the landscape didn't yeah, she? Yes she did Yeah, and yeah. I love that description of Mary's arrival Oh my goodness, isn't <laughs> it amazing? Manor. It really yeah. is yeah. and now that we live in Yorkshire I found that really added an extra layer of interest Absolutely. for me in the reading look of the more in the dark but then as the spring virgins there and, exactly yeah. and she talks about the wind wuthering oh, I know. around this old house and we live in an old house and, and the wind definitely does. wuthers <laughs> and there's a bit where she feels almost like she's at sea and I really identify yes. with that sound me too the sound of the wind, wind. we've felt that yes. living here and have yeah. talked about that and I mean we're not up on the moor it would just no. be even more <laughs> even more more windy and wild. Yeah. Um, so I love those Yorkshire references. And Frances Hodgson Burnett had definitely read and loved Jane Eyre. Oh yeah, it, that's very clear, yes. isn't it? Even the way the character sort of has some of the same experiences with the, the coach ride and at, at the beginning and yes. um, coming to the, the house. Exactly, like, like Jane. And like Jane, Mary is herself... Um, a lonely orphan yeah. um, who hasn't been shown any love mm -hmm. as a young girl. Um, and there are other parallels with Jane Eyre, I think, too. The fact that Colin's father is this mysterious character who's mm. so often away. Yeah. That's a yeah. bit of a parallel to Mr. Rochester. It is. It and, is. of course, the way that Mary discovers Colin, who has been kept in this other part of the house. She and, hears his cries yes, at night. Exactly. Yes, exactly. It's a um, lot like That is, the of laughs. course, reminiscent yeah. of Jane Eyre as well. Yeah. Um, so I enjoyed... Um, thinking about some of those parallels, Absolutely. and I think that there, yeah, you know, is a definite. Nod they're done to with a light touch, but I really think they're there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, I did love the Yorkshire setting, even though the garden that really um, is was the real one that the Secret yeah. Garden is based on. Uh, it was actually in Kent. Yes, I yes. love the fact that she did set this in Yorkshire, yeah. Yeah. and um, it really is a wonderful. Yorkshire read. It really is. Um, now, of course, the action of the book actually starts out in India. It does. And that's somewhere that Frances Hodgson Burnett never visited. <laughs> um, so I'm not yeah. quite sure why she started it there. I suppose it was very common if you had somebody who was sent back to England or who'd lost both parents or whatever. Yes, that was exactly. Quite, um, um, and of course, the attitudes of the time um, of yeah. a colonial Britain are reflected in this book and in the appalling way that Mary speaks of and treats her Indian servants. Um, I think that you're meant to really dislike Mary. 
I think um, from so. how she treats people yes, yes. at the start. You feel of sorry the book. for her, but you you can't like her attitudes or no, her. exactly. She's very unlikable. It's a bit like what Jane Austen says about Emma, but she's way more unlikable than Emma. Oh, I find. Oh yes, 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 much, yes, much more unlikable. Um, yeah. She's a really unpleasant character yeah. at the beginning. So her transformation is even more wonderful, yes. um, perhaps because yeah. of that. But I also wanted to recommend a particular edition because. I think if you're reading The Secret Garden now with a child or if you're giving the book um, to a child to read by themselves, this mm. is a really good new edition that also provides some footnotes around the context of the time and some of the racist and colonial attitudes at that time that are present um, in the book. This really does provide does. some information. When, when you first read it, I read it with you. We talked about it. I could give some of that background, but you might yeah. find it's a child that reads it alone or is old enough to go off. And, and it's lovely to give them something like that that sort of puts it in context yes, really exactly. well and explains. But also, like you said, I mean, it's a really good... Um, way into having a discussion yeah. on many of these issues yeah. and I know that that's what you did with yes. me um, yeah. as a child and that's important to do and to remember to do when you're reading classics from a particular time period yeah. like this one. Um, but another thing that um, you said that I think is so true is that um, it's unusual to have such an unlikable character. I know. I don't <laughs> in a, a, as a child character, character. start the book. Yes. That is unusual. I mean, that's very different from Jane Eyre. Like you like Jane Eyre yeah. a lot, yeah. right from the start. Yeah. With Mary, you feel very sorry for her. Mary, and you understand how she's become, I think. I think you do. How she is, yes. yes. Um, but she really is hard to like. Yes. And the same with Colin yes. at the beginning. Um, he's really utterly ghastly. Yeah. And it is, of course, the garden and this healing power of nature um, encompassing the moorland, perhaps, as well as the yeah. garden. Mary becomes a lot healthier and happier. But it isn't just nature. No, it isn't. It's also some of the people yes. um, that she yes. meets, specifically Martha and Dickon, and the sort of off-stage voice of their mother. Yes, <laughs> yes. Who yes. is always advising. Love that. And I, I yeah. love that too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is a point that Miriam made as well as how important the characters, and these characters in particular, are to Mary's transformation, perhaps as much as the garden is important. So let's listen to Miriam's message. Hi, Miranda, Donna, and the Comfort Book Club family. I'm Miriam from California. After reading The Secret Garden, I said to myself, what a sweet, special story. To me, it's a total story about healing and how you have these three very broken people, Mary, Colin, and Mr. Craven. They were able to find happiness and come together as a family. I love that sec section where Mary met Colin for the first time and they found out they were cousins and they had so much in common, both being unwanted. While a lot of the credit for this healing seems to come from the famous garden, I think it's a combination of the servant Martha's encouragement, the gardener's stories, and my favorite character in the book, Dickon. He was like the Pied Piper, where the animals all followed him, and he had a great way with Mary and Colin. Anyway, thanks for this recommending this book. It was really good. Oh, thank you, Miriam. Thank you so much, Miriam. Yes, wasn't it true, though? And also, I think it was um, Dickon and Martha's mother, you know, sending them lots of, like, fresh milk and her, her buns. And she understood that they needed to eat and they needed to get outside and have their appetite whetted by doing physical work. She sent the skipping rope. She was so important to making really all of them, you know, both children stronger. And she allowed Dickon to go and follow, you know, follow around, do the gardening. He built, like, their kitchen garden, I think, so that they all had... Um, great food, you know, as much as they could, just from yes. seeds and everything. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because it's shown that this kind of like working class, servant class, um, at that point, 
had so much more common sense and practicality and just like kindness and love and everything that they're able to express in the book than Colin's father, for instance. Um, And I think that some of that was an influence uh, of Frances Hodgson's Burnett's um, American background. I think you're right. Um, She grew up in that society in yeah. which everyone was seen in a much more democratic um, and equal way. Yes. Not entirely, of course, no. um, but she had more of those sort of American ideals. Exactly. Um, that at that time especially... And she had known a, real poverty herself too. She had yes. real poverty. Yeah. Um, when yeah. they moved from the UK to the States, they were very, very poor, and that's yes. when she first started writing in order to support herself and her family. Um, So she knew what real poverty was. Um, But I I do love those characters so much. And uh, Madeline, another comfort book club reader, sent in a message um, also talking about these characters like Martha and Dickon, but also on the use of the Yorkshire dialect in the book, um, which I found very interesting too. So let's listen to Madeline's message. Hey up, Miranda and Donna. I am Madeleine from Normandy. It was such a delight to read The Secret Garden. Sometimes it was like standing in the garden myself, smelling the roses and feeling this tremendous joy with Mary, Dickon and Colin. This garden has a real healing power, but Yorkshire dialect takes a large part in this process too. Deacon and his mother are great teachers for Mary and Colin. And it's not only a matter of sound or pronunciation, it's also a way to share simplicity and real wisdom with them. It reminds me when my grandmother spoke Shtimi, the North dialect of France. With this kind of knowledge, you can perform a lot in your life. Thank you so much for this positive reading. Oh, thank you, Madeline. Yes, thank you, Madeline. Uh, that was so interesting. And yes, I found the use of dialect mm. um, was very interesting in the book. And Frances Hodgson Burnett had a real interest in dialect. I think she was partly influenced by Elizabeth Gaskell yes. and her books. Um, because when she started out writing herself, Frances Hodgson Burnett um, wrote some early adult books really about the horrific working conditions of people up north, like pit workers and mill workers, for instance. And she used dialect in those books. She also herself would have heard it in her everyday life, in her childhood, Mm -hmm. um, when they lived in Manchester and then um, Salford, I think. And so she remembered that. Yeah, I think she did really well. And there was a real interest at that time, I think, too. You think of William Barnes in Dorset doing a lot of dialect poems. That was very common. And, yeah, it was very, very, very interesting. The sort of... uh, Nowadays, I think especially maybe for children's books, you wouldn't see publishers being so eager about having parts that weren't proper English, you know, that were maybe harder for harder a child to read. And, to read. Yes, yeah. harder to yeah. understand, yes. Yeah. Um, but I think you do get such a flavour of their characters. You do. And then, through um, the way they speak. And the way, that, like, Colin and, and Mary almost, like, practice it together. It becomes yes. like another bond between them that they yes. develop this way of speaking they they're so much um impressed by martha and dickon and yes. their, you know the whole, their mother yeah yes yeah, yeah. i love that yeah. motherly presence yes that is there in the novel even though she's quite an off-stage character yes uh, for a lot of the time but they get that kind of mothering and they so much want that. You they find do. Mary and Colin really are craving yeah. that. Yeah. Um, which is really touching in the book. But let's talk about the garden itself oh, a yes. bit too, because of course this is such an important aspect of the secret garden and it has become an important part of a lot of people's lives who yeah. read the book. A lot of readers credit the secret garden with having made them gardeners. Yes, I thought it was fascinating that someone said you could actually get 
you could learn how to prune roses from the descriptions that she gives. Yes, you know? and I think that's important to note, actually, yeah. that yeah. Frances Hodgson Burnett did garden herself. She knew what she was talking about. So there are some actual practical tips mm. um, in the book, which is lovely. But one of our comfort book club readers, Anita, said that reading this book had in fact inspired her to create a secret garden in her life. So let's listen to Anita's message. Hello, Miranda, Donna, and all the Comfort Book Club readers. This is Anita from the US. I do love the secret garden. The white pictures of Yorkshire combined with the dignity of Mrs. Sowerby, the transformation of Mary, the robinness of Dickon, and Colin's miracle all make this book such a fun and upbeat experience. Colin asked at one point, do you believe in magic? I hope you do. The first time I ever read this book, it inspired me to create my very own secret garden, and I've been enjoying it ever since. Thank you, Miranda, for a lovely book choice. Oh, thank you, Anita. And how amazing that you created a secret garden yourself. I'm so impressed. Thank you, Anita. <laughs> yes. That was that was something that was must really have helped a lot of people, I think, reading that mm. and realising, oh, I want my own secret <laughs> garden. But to actually do it, that's well, another exactly. thing, isn't it? Yes. Um, but the idea of this garden came from a garden that Frances Hodgson Burnett actually created mm. um, when she was um i think in her sort of 50s she was a bit older and she'd already had made a lot of money uh, was a very well known successful writer um she rented a big house called Maytham Hall in Kent yeah. and it was there that she really developed her passion for gardening and she transformed i think some of the old like kitchen gardens um into a rose garden and she planted like hundreds of roses know, and trained them to go up the trees the old fruit trees mm. that were in the garden already and there are some pictures of it um in this book only in black and white but it still is so special to see them and she loved to go and write in this rose garden that she she's created sitting there with your table yes and she had this little battered old table yes, wooden yes. table and a wooden chair and apparently if it got too bright then she had a kind of um parasol that she oh, put up you know but she loved writing there and I think the garden was really like her sanctuary yeah. at that time and a lot of the inspiration for the secret garden came from this mm. period in her life which was for the most part quite a happy period um she tamed a robin in that garden it would come and eat crumbs from her yes, hand yes, um, lovely. which is such a lovely detail to know about and apparently her head gardener provided a lot of the inspiration behind Ben, ben Weatherstaff. Such yes, a great name yes, for a gardener, yes, isn't it? Yes, it really is. <laughs> um, I love to how uh, Misselthwaite Manor. Yeah. Um, Misselthwaite is apparently a kind of form of like mistletoe. So oh, even wow. the, the manor house that she goes to has a reference to a plant which I think is rather I think lovely. That's lovely. Mm. Yes, yes. Um but yes and she became really a, a passionate gardener herself from starting with this rose garden. Later in her life she moved back to the States. Yeah. Um but even there she created a beautiful garden on Long Island. Yes and one in Bermuda as yes. well. She almost had both places yes. full with roses. Yes, and, and she was always yes. writing off for more seeds and sort of writing <laughs> yes. letters about what she wanted people to do in the garden and uh, everything. Yeah. So um I think it was really special to to read a bit more about the gardens that were so important in her lifetime. Yeah. But as others have said, this is a book that's very much about transformation. Mm -hmm. There's a transformation of the garden itself yes. from an almost dead garden into one that is so beautifully and brilliantly alive. Yes. But it's also about the transformation of Mary's character yes. and Colin's character yes. too. Yes. And one of our comfort book club readers, Marie, sent in a message about this transformation of Mary and not just of her... Um, 
spiritual transformation yeah. not just of her character but of her physical transformation yes. too yes. Um, that happens in the book so let's listen to Marie's message hello Miranda Donna and Comfort Book Club readers this is Marie I was delighted to revisit the secret garden because I have always held on to my dream of having my own walled garden at the beginning of the story Mary is a sour-faced bad-tempered girl whom nobody likes and what I like most about this story is the transformation she undergoes as she learns to think about things other than herself and takes joy in the pleasure of tending a garden. It is Mrs Medlock who observes towards the end of the book that Mary had not had time to pay attention to her changing face, but remembered her pleasure in looking at the Mem Sahib and thought that Mary might someday look like her mother. Oh, thank you, Marie. Yes, thank you, Marie. And I, I, I was interested in that too, because at one point they talk about um, uh, an old uh, fairy tale by uh, Charles Peru. And um, it's one that I read. And basically it's about like how even the power of love can make someone you look at beautiful in the end even without magic um, if you come to really appreciate someone it can mm -hmm. beautify them and you can see I think that just by physically filling out eating plenty losing that yellow tinge and mm -hmm. everything um, obviously Mary's going to be a beauty and she's going to blossom you know and she is yes. um, but I think it's also right too that it's through seeing that she's loved by others by you know those around yeah. her that she also begins to transform yes I completely mm. agree and something else that really struck me on this reread was how some of these thoughts on the power of positive thinking and yeah. like this kind of yeah. message in the book um, chimes so much with a lot of current thinking. Absolutely, <laughs> with mind and body being so linked. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was just fascinated to think about that. And um, one of our Comfort Book Club readers, Erico, sent in a message about this. So let's listen to Erico's message. Hello, Comfort Book Club readers. It's Erica from England. The Secret Garden was extremely emotional and deeply spiritual read for me. I thought the story had such a positive, life-affirming message for us. It's telling us that whatever life may throw at us, it is never too late to change and start to grow again, just like the Secret Garden Mary discovered in the book. And contrary to popular belief, we humans really don't need much to thrive emotionally and spiritually. All we require is natural world around us, love, companionship, hope and faith in our own magic, as Colin does in the book. And I just love the quote in the book where he says, Where you tend a rose, a thistle cannot grow. And Colin's joyful cry, exclaiming, I'm going to live forever and ever and ever, is still echoing in my head. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Erico. <laughs> yes, thank you, Erico. Um, and yes, that's such a lovely quote. And I think Frances Hodgson Burnett was interested in psychology and she yeah. was exploring ideas about psychology in this book. Um, Freud and his theories on the power of the mind were becoming more and more popular mm -hmm. at this time and she was definitely interested herself. She also um, sought medical help of this kind, more of a sort of psychological um, therapy based yes. um, help for some of her own sufferings that she went through. Yeah. So I think she was very much interested in this idea. Or was it her son who became a Christian scientist? Her son, I think, yeah, Vivian yeah. became a Christian scientist. I think she also um, was interested in some of those ideas. She didn't become one herself. Um, but this was all considered part of the kind of new thought, yes. I think they yes. Um, yes. put it as these ideas of Freud and of this early psychology yeah. yeah I think it's important to note that you know Colin isn't physically ill no. in the book um it really 
does stem so much from his psychology and his fears and yes. so much of it is internal yeah. and it's those fears that have kept him inside and then kept him weak through no exercise yeah. you know it's dangerous to think that if you have a real physical illness um, you can just think yourself well yeah. and that isn't what she's showing in this no, book Colin no. is not in fact physically ill um, and it is his own um mental attitude absolutely. that he has to overcome absolutely i think that's really well done too as he he, he uh, one of the first things is he agrees to let mary look at him you know yes. and things like that he's been so frightened of people looking at yes. him, and it's mary reassuring him there's not a lump in your spine <laughs> yes. it's quite a very sort of matter of fact yeah, way quite quite yeah quite an impatient yeah. way yeah but yeah. i think it both shows how lonely they've both been yeah. and how they really can help each other yeah. um, in the end too. But yes, it is so interesting. So many um, podcasts or books nowadays uh, really focus on this mind-body connection as well. But I wanted to end this discussion with um, a quote that Frances Hodgson Burnett wrote in a, in a later um, essay in her life. Yeah. Um, she said something along the lines of, if you have a garden, you have a future. And I thought yeah. what a lovely quote that is, especially perhaps remembering that The Secret Garden is a wonderful book about tending a physical garden and yes. the joys that nature itself can bring. But I also think it's a book that teaches you how to tend the garden of your mind. Yeah. And this idea of if you plant a rose in your mind, a thistle cannot grow yeah, in the same that's place. That's a lovely quote as well, isn't it? It really is, yes, and yes. Erico shared it too, and that's one of my favourite quotes from the book. Mm. And I think that idea of having a garden in your mind that you also take care of and tend um, will make you have a happier future too, and I really love that That's idea wonderful and i love the way that the joy at the end mm. um with um mr uh, craven and colin walking together in this joyous yes. way it's not actually shown from the point of view of mary and dickon mm. it's shown from the point of view of the housekeeper and um, ben weatherstaff yes. together and you realize that joy that's visible and alive mm. and shared and part of a community is also wonderful for everybody who views it too yes. and i i loved that aspect of the the final bit yes showing how it rippled out yeah oh that's yeah. lovely and i completely agree but thank you so much to everyone who read along with us this month extra big thanks to the people who sent in a voice message to add to our discussion um don't remember that anne of green gables don't is forget. our yeah, don't forget, <laughs> do remember, <laughs> do remember. <laughs> um, that Anne of Green Gables is our April comfort book club choice. Yeah. I can't wait to discuss no. this one too. Another You've been real reading through so classic. many of them as well. But yes, I'm trying to read all of the Anne of Green Gables series before our discussion and I've been really enjoying doing yeah. that. But yes, thank you so much for watching this video. Huge thanks to those of you who pressed the super thanks button on my last video. I always so appreciate your support. I hope you've been having a wonderful long Easter weekend and I'll see you again next Sunday. Goodbye. Bye-bye.